Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Edwin Chalbois. I'm one of the co-directors of the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies Methods Corps under the directorship of um, our leader, uh, Tor, Tor Neelands, and my, uh, on behalf of, of the Methods Corps and the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, we want to welcome you to our inaugural um, alcohol uh, biomarker update workshop. This is uh, the first in a series of workshops that we've developed to provide not only um, uh, an introductory didactic form of, of education around selective topics, but also some deep dives into what's it actually like um, to employ some of these methods in, in the field and an, and an extended opportunity for, um, for question and answers. Um, I think this, this fields the, this um, matches the diverse needs that we've received in um, some of our other uh, one hour town hall formats. So this is our new expanded format um, in subsequent uh, in, in subsequent announcements um, that you may be receiving, we're going to um, have uh, workshops on uh, discrete choice experiments, on natural language processing, and other priority issues um, that we have identified within our center and within, within our colleagues. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're very, um, very pleased today to, to have three experts in the field of alcohol biomarkers. We have Dr. Judy Johan from UCSF, who's going to um, introduce us to the, the current state of alcohol uh, uh, biomarker measurement and, and analysis, um, and also point us in the direction of some, of some future advancements. And then we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Julianne Jett from Washington State University and Dr. Yan Wang, University of Florida, to actually prevent, um, along with Dr. Han, some of these um, uh, use cases of in, in, in the field. And um, get here. Oops. And some of the goals of this workshop today, um, uh, you know, at, at following that format, we really want to learn about some of the current uh, alcohol biomarker options, um, be introduced to some, some of the new biomarkers that are in development, um, and then get, uh, get our, a chance to hear about actual um, use in, in the field, the advantages, disadvantages, and, and, and good things to know, and then uh, have a, an extended time for getting, uh, having discussion and getting um, individual questions um, from our experts. Um, we're very cognizant of Zoom fatigue, and so we've scheduled in um, nice 10 minute breaks in between these, especially for those people on the West Coast, because this, this workshop um, uh, encompasses the, 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 the lunch hour. So again, welcome. Um, before we get started, um, we thought it went, might be um, it might, might be nice um, if people could uh, in the chat just list the um, institution that they're from, because um, I know we have um, more than thirty folks uh, registered for this workshop, and it includes individuals from all across the U.S. and Canada. Um, so if you could just um, Say hi and and type your institution in the chat. Um, we'd like to we'd like to take a look and, and see that. So, thank you, everyone. Let me stop sharing for the moment, and we can we can wave, and then I will <laughs> queue up the next bit of slides. Uh, Tor, any introductory comments um, that you'd like like to make as a, the director of the Methods Corps? No, Edwin, I think you summarized it quite well, except to thank you and uh, the speakers for um, putting this all together today. I know these things don't just happen magically. It's not like slide decks fall from heaven and we can just present them. So all of this represents a, a lot of work and careful thought. And uh, we're very, very appreciative and really looking forward to this um, workshop today. Great, thanks. Well, now it's my honor to turn it over to Dr. Judy Hahn. Judy Hahn is a professor in the HIV, ID, and Global Medicine Division um, within the Department of Medicine here at, at UCSF. Um, she's an epidemiolo epidemiologist with extensive experience studying, um, uh, studying the behavioral and biological interactions of substance use, particularly alcohol and infectious diseases. She leads multiple um, NIH-funded studies to reduce the harmful impact of alcohol um, use in HIV outcomes. She's done a lot of work in East Africa in studies that I'm involved with. And Judy is really, for me, the go-to expert on, on alcohol research and particularly 
um, alcohol measurement as being one of the first investigators to use a number of the alcohol metabolite scales um, in, in my experience and bringing them into our research groups. So um, Judy, thank you again um, for helping us with, with this update and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Welcome everybody. Nice to see people I know. I'd love to meet the people here I don't know. So um, thanks for attending. I think it's a small enough group that we can probably do break in questions. Um, so um, I don't know if Edwin, you want to keep an eye on people raising their hand or if there's a chat that that seems relevant for me to just like stop. I'm totally happy to. Um, we'll do. Yeah, and I'm going to throw in a few little like sort of how I got to this really strange point in my career that I became the alcohol biomarker person um, because it's it's kind of fun um, to be able to think back on that. So um, let's go ahead. Um, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna remind you why we care about alcohol in the HIV field, since this is a, um, a CIFAR run um, group here, then talk about probably what you already know about self reported alcohol use, but just to kind of think about it a little bit, then talk about biomarkers and biosensors. Um, and then think a little bit about some of the current questions. Um, and then I guess that's probably repetitive discussion and key questions. Go ahead. Next slide. Okay, so I just wanted to remind you, you can get um, clicked a little more. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that the slide had this animation. Um, oh, back one. There we go. Okay, here we go. So alcohol, so you know, we all know about the HIV continuum from diagnosis through um, receipt of care through viral suppression. Well, alcohol affects um, really all points of the continuum in both in both behavioral and biological ways. Um, alcohol use affecting sexual risk behavior and HIV infection, also su affecting susceptibility, biologic susceptibility to infection. Um, getting well, the diagnosis is the is the more behavioral part of getting getting um, into care and getting getting diagnosed and then getting care, and staying on care. Again, that's that's maybe the more behavioral part. But then there's a host of other things going on when you're drinking alcohol and you have HIV. Um, that you know how alcohol may affect um substantially it substantially affects adherence it also um really affects a lot of the comorbidities that i have listed on the side comorbidities co-occurring conditions like tuberculosis um, hepatitis and uh, the mental health issues intimate partner violence etc inflammation frailty so there's kind of a whole host of things that alcohol is impacting that is um you know is impacting behavior and and health outcomes um, just overall, you know, not even thinking about HIV is a reminder that alcohol use is a causative factor in 5% of the global burden of disability and actually I should say mortality. So it is a huge intervenable um, health issue that, that really affects people worldwide. Uh, and for a long time, people didn't think about alcohol and HIV because you couldn't get HIV from drinking alcohol, but directly, but obviously indirectly. Okay, um, you click one more. There we go. And one more click. There we go. So my work has mostly been in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, like I said, alcohol affects people worldwide. But what's interesting here is on the, the map on the left shows the incidence of HIV in 2017. And you see that Sub-Saharan Africa has the majority. Um, and then um, the, the picture on the right <laughs> um, shows shows patterns of drinking and the darker brown, certainly the, the really bright color is um, is Russia, um, but the rest of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa has the darker brown, um, especially in Southern Africa that has pretty high levels of drinking. Really worldwide, there's a lot of, a lot of alcohol use, but that sort of intersection there is what has led me to have um, a lot of my work focused on alcohol and HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, next. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to talk about self-reported alcohol use. Next. Um, I think of self-report in a couple of ways, in, in two different ways, because I think it's important thinking about um, when and how you're trying to assess alcohol use. Um, certainly, our sort of standard survey type assessments of alcohol use are retrospective. What happened over the last blah, 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 days, months, year, et cetera. And we do have several standardized and validated questions, um, validated to, to some extent. Um, most commonly uses the audit or the audit C. There's the CAGE, there's TLFB, which stands for timeline follow back, which is a day by day questioning. And then there's the WHO assist. And there are many others, but those are the ones that um, 
really seeing mostly in the HIV literature. Um, in addition, self-report can be prospective. Um, and that the traditional, the, back in the old days, there was something called a daily diary where it was like a notebook where people wrote down, you know, they had a little grid of what they wrote down, how much they drank. Now that's a little bit more cell phone based. Um, and people, and it can be, it can be that you're supposed to fill it in every day, or it can be that you're supposed to be, fill it in based on maybe a text message prompt. So um, that's a prospective way to measure alcohol use. Um, you can't go into the, you know, if you went into your doctor's office and they want to know how you're drink, how much you've been drinking, unless you've already started doing this, it's not going to um, help at all, but it, it could help prospectively and it can be also part of um, interventions and intervention assessment. So certainly cell phones, um, tablets, uh, you know, web-based things are also fall into that category of this prospective assessment and they can um, occur um, quite frequently. And I think that I don't know if Julianne wants to talk is going to mention it, but I know that her group um, uses that in some of their in some of their work. Okay, next, um, maybe something obvious self report low cost, you can get lots and lots of detail depending on how many questions you ask. We do have standardized tools and cutoffs. And it's also immediate you have the person in front of you, you ask them how much they are drinking have been drinking, etc. So there's there are many advantages to self report. So I don't want to throw out that baby with bath water. So next. But there are some challenges, um, which is okay. So the first one is recall bias. Um, obvious, it can be hard, especially when questions start asking about a longer time period um, in the past. It can be hard to answer these questions. Next, um, quantification. When we're asking people to try to measure, tell tell us how many drinks they were having, they may not know. Perhaps um, you know they think they had one drink, but it was actually two drinks. Hooverville is known for its generous whiskey pours in the Seattle Times. Next. And then again, you know, you ask someone how many drinks they have. This, this is really shocking. This is a, um, I found this on the internet. You can order a glass with your name on it. Um, <laughs> but, um, so that might, Wendy might say she had a glass of wine, whereas when we are trying to study it, we probably think she had, you know, two or three glasses of wine. Thanks. And then um, really alcohol is a very, alcohol use is a very social behavior and there's a lot of drink sharing and it's really hard to know how much you've had when you're sharing a bottle or, or a brew around a pot with, uh, with other people. Thanks. So then the, the problem that I've encountered really the most and that has probably inspired my, you know, really push for objective measures is um, social desirability bias, although those other things are, are important as well. And that's um, called faking good. And, I'm sure you're aware of it, reporting to obtain approval by responding in a culturally appropriate and appropriate and acceptable manner. Um, my third bullet there, it's still, it, it may or may not be deliberate. It may be self, um, you know, self-deception. People may think that they are drinking less. Um, it's really, I find it really, really important in, when we're thinking about um, trying to help people change their behavior. If we counsel them to, especially if it's a sort of a counseling type behavior, we counsel them to change their behavior, it may be a little bit harder for them to answer um, objectively or, or well after that kind of counseling, how much alcohol they've been consuming. And I also think based on this picture is, is trying to illustrate that there's picture, um, settings with unequal power or prestige. I don't know, you know, if this woman is drinking three glasses of wine every night, is she really going to tell this guy that um, that's what she's drinking? I'm, I'm not so sure. So um, it's, it's just it's just quite challenging. There's there's a lot of things wrapped up in, in reporting how much you're drinking. Um, and and there's there's pretty good data that it is leading to under report in, for alcohol use and substance use. Um, I did want to comment that there is a there is something called a social desirability scale um, that is a sort of self report that tries to get at, get at this concept. Um, there's one called the Marlowe Crown scale. It's a 33 point um, scale. It asks true false questions for, uh, based on items that are considered to be social socially desirable but unlikely to occur. So you have to endorse true or false. Something like, I don't find it difficult to get along with loud mouth obnoxious people. Yeah, I never have that problem. You know, <laughs> that's my socially desirable response. But yes, of course, I do have that problem. Um, so people who answer in a socially desirable manner may have or should have a higher um, score on this. I do have to say that this um, scale was developed in 1960. It was um, done on some college students and maybe retested on graduate students, but it hasn't been really 
extensively studied. They they did um, they did study it in um, in Africa a little bit, but I feel like you know if any of you are like sort of scale minded people, psychologists. Um, I think this is an area for development. And if we would have something that maybe would help us, you know, with the self report, maybe cheaper than biomarkers or maybe in combination with biomarkers, it's just something I want to put out there. It's like this would be a really ripe um, avenue for research, I think. There are other um, impression management scales out there also that I have the link to on the bottom there um, that are in a similar vein, but I, I haven't seen these really, really used that well. I have, and just to put in a plug, I have actually been doing the Marlow crown scale since in my research studies since around 2010. So we've we've written one paper on it, but I think there's a lot more. So if anyone, you know, is looking for some kind of juicy project that wants to think about uh, moving that forward, that would be amazing. Okay. I wonder how social uh, social media may have altered that, you know, the 60s is a long time ago and pu public discourse, I think really has been affected by our use of social media and what's acceptable and what's not. So I'm, 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 I'm curious, like, uh, how applicable this is and what may have changed in the interim. Yeah, I, yeah, we could look at the questions one by one. I, I don't know, um, but um, there was what there was one question. There was one question that they actually removed from the Uganda, um, the Africa version that was something like, I research all the candidates in an election before I vote. And I thought that was great, but they actually took that one out of the, the, the Africa version. They felt like it wasn't it wasn't applicable. Okay. Any you know thoughts uh, you know discussion we want to have about maybe the social desirability or the self-report or other issues that you think I should have mentioned? I'm not Judy, seeing anything in the Amy. chat. Go ahead, Amy. Um, just a recommendation, would you, do you typically include one of the, the Marlowe crown or the others in most of your studies? And is it worth yes. including if you have space? I think, I think it is worth including. It's a little long. Um, I think we could do better is kind of what I'm saying. I've been doing it because that's what, I, you know, is there, but I would love for someone to Im improve upon it. And, you know, it, I mean, one area, it's also an area of research of, you know, can we predict can we predict a priori poor reporting? I mean, that's kind of the, that's what it's trying to do. And maybe we can't. Um, we've tried a bit in some of our data and haven't been complete, very successful. Um, but if there were ways to do it, maybe, you know, yeah. And so if you could, you know, so I've started some of my analyses, we do like, we do sensitivity analyses. We, we you know, alcohol use versus something. And then we say, well, what if we just, um, stratified by social desirability, like only look at the people who have lower social desirability scores to see if that's different from the people who had higher social desirability scores. There's a few ways you could look at it, you know, the statistical people here may have thoughts on it as well. Um, but it's sort of like a um, kind of like a what's it called? Um, corroboration kind of thing. Okay, let's go on to biomarkers then. Um, so let's uh, next slide. Uh, I was going to talk about how I became interested in alcohol biomarkers. You click, there's a few um, bullet points. So back in the mid 2000s, I was working with my mentor was David Bangsberg, and he was looking at the rollout of antiretrovirals in Africa. And there was um, some concern about whether they were going to, there was going to be a lot of liver toxicity. Um, and given one of the reasons why there was concern was that you know it was it was happening in Uganda and the WHO had reported that Uganda had the highest total um, consumption of alcohol um, consumed. Um, thanks. That's that's all the bullets there. <laughs> um, so whoop, whoop. keep going back. Thanks. My apologies. I, I forgot that these were animated. Um, <laughs> time, yeah, so. the timings are built in. <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and take them off next time. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so we had this WHO statistic: high, high alcohol use. The ARVs are being rolled out. My mentor, and this is where I was sort of thinking, this is like kind of a mentoring thing because I was very junior, and he had this study, and he said, "Hey, let's, you know, or let's think about the alcohol use." So, so I started looking at the data, and I found very, very low self-reported 
current alcohol use among the people who started ARVs, which was really inconsistent with what the WHO was saying. The WHO, it turned out, actually had their estimates a little off, and it was really still Russia that really did have the highest level of alcohol use. But Uganda still, among their drinkers, have very high levels of drinking. Um, and that that kind of inspired me to think, okay, what can we do about it? And that was my first um, my first grant as a researcher was I got a pilot grant, sort of like a wrap grant, to do biomarker testing in some of their stored specimens to see if we could confirm under report. I was using an older biomarker that I'll talk about, um, uh, but it it did sort of get the ball rolling on me thinking about thinking about self report and thinking about alcohol biomarkers. Okay, next. And then that actually led to my first um, NIH funded study, which was an R21. Click and, um, once or twice. That's it. Um, where we actually looked at a bunch of different candidate biomarkers to see how well they could measure uh, self, uh, how well they could measure alcohol use in the Ugandan setting. We used instead of using self-report to compare, we actually had guys going out on um, Boda Boda's little motorcycles every day and do breathalyzer testing of the uh, study participants. So that was our gold standard, knowing how to know how much they were drinking. That was a study participant and her daughter. Okay, next. So that's how I got into this field. So alcohol biomarkers um, run into two different categories. There are direct metabolites. That's something that um, basically you take in the alcohol and your your body metabolizes it. So ethanol, ethanol itself um, can be found in your body. It can be found in blood, in breath, in urine, and sweat. Um, phosphatidyl ethanol or PEF, uh, which I talk about a lot, is in whole blood and dry blood spots. Ethylglucoronide is found in blood, urine, um, hair, and nails, and they all have different sort of windows of um, alcohol detection. And then there's something called fatty acid ethyl esters and hair meconium. Those are the ones, those are all the direct metabolites that we know of at this point. Um, and then there are indirect markers. So you may have heard sort of in the past, people talked about using liver enzymes. Um, people with high liver enzymes, it may be because they're drinking a lot. So people actually have recommended using those as alcohol biomarkers. So there's ALT and AST, a lesser known marker, GGT. MCV is about the blood cells. Um, HDL is um, the cholesterol and blood pressure. Those things are all um, affected by alcohol use and maybe may be increased or decreased with with increase in de decreasing alcohol use. However, they're not specific, right? They're uh, impacted by other health and wellness factors. Um, so they're not specific for alcohol use. They could be helpful potentially. They're certainly um, cheaper than most of the other biomarkers, but they're not very specific. And then this other older marker that I mentioned um, is called carbohydrate deficient transferrin. It's also an indirect biomarker, but it's actually fairly specific for alcohol use, but only for quite heavy alcohol use. And that is the marker that I used in my first study there. Okay, next. So talking about the direct biomarkers, I'm going to first talk about the direct biomarkers of recent alcohol use. And that includes, so alcohol is found in the breath, so that includes um, breathalyzers. And um, breathalyzers have improved, they're very portable, and they can be high tech. And the, the recent improvements, it's been a few years now, but they've, I think they've been improving as they go and maybe I don't know if Julianne is using that in in their work but there's um a few that have remote um that have facial recognition so that you don't have the problem of worrying about someone handing the breathalyzer off to someone else um you can confirm they have um they have sort of a text messaging capabilities and timestamps so that you can um, send someone messages that says, please, you know, blow into the breathalyzer within the next hour and you can find out if they did and if it was the right person. So these are, I think, pretty exciting and I have actually hopes of um, using them in our studies. We, in my early studies, we used just basic breathalyzers, just, you know, on site with study participants. Those worked, those worked well too, but I like the fact that this may allow some, um, can, can allow for some remote work, which is nice and less invasive. Um, the next, yeah, so the next biomarker of recent use is recent, but it's now prospective. You can, you can measure for a long period of time is the biomarkers in the alcohol, of alcohol in sweat. Um, and that's what Jan's going to talk about um, in the next hour. It's, what's nice about them is they um, have nearly continuous sampling of the sweat. So it can be every 30 minutes. It can be more often. Um, they can detect um, 
They're pretty good at detecting significant drinking episodes. Again, Jan's going to update us on that. And there's it's a lot of data, so there's sort of algorithms to kind of get through the noise on the data. Um, the one, the picture on the right is the scram. That one is pretty well. Um, it's been validated. It's been used. It's used in law enforcement. It's it's very reliable. Again, it doesn't it doesn't um, get at the light drinking episodes, but it does get at the heavier ones pretty well. But it is bulky and a little bit stigmatizing to wear. So there's these newer models that we'll hear about later. Next. Um, and then the last biomarker of recent alcohol use, it, other than ethanol found in urine or blood, is um, this urine ethylglucuronide. And it's a metabolite of alcohol that's formed in the liver. And it represents alcohol consumption over the prior two or three days. Um, but really best represents quite recent use, basically within the day. Um, it is, um, what's interesting about this compared to some of the other biomarkers is that there are a couple ways to get it tested. You can just get it tested at commercial lab like Quest. Um, you could also have a, if you're doing a lot of these tests, um, which they are doing in a spoke at Washington um, State University, the benchtop immunoassay where they, they have their own machine and they just run them. Um, and then it pictured in the top there, there's actually a dipstick um, on the market that um, are, are fairly low cost and can be done really anywhere you are, and we are we are using them in a study in Uganda. Um, sometimes when people measure this, they normalize the urine for creatinine, basically how sort of dilute your your urine is. Um, but it hasn't seemed to be a big standard in the field, um, and there are some um, some reports of false positives due to hand sanitizer, mouthwash. I guess e-cigarettes sometimes have a little bit of of alcohol in them as well. Um, so, so there's issues about what cu what cutoff you use, and I think the hand sanitizer thing may start to be a little bit more of an issue um, as we do studies. That, you know, if you're studying healthcare workers during COVID, you may you may have an issue there. But it, it's the the it's nice that there's there is a dipstick. That's like our one uh, dipstick alcohol uh, biomarker. Okay, so the next um, is medium term alcohol biomarkers and I have them as, as long term study outcomes it's you know if you're trying to trying to get that retrospective look of what someone was doing over the last, you know, at least couple of weeks. Um, these are the biomarkers to think about. So the first one that I mentioned before it's an indirect marker um, is the carbohydrate carbohydrate deficient transferrin. And um, it has to do with your iron transport through your blood that gets messed up for some reason with a certain amount of alcohol use. It has a pretty long half-life. So if you're drinking really heavily and then st stop, you can see actually the change in the CDT, um, at, but after you stop for, for a while. The the sort of downside to it, or maybe upside to it, I mean, it, it, it's, is that it detects heavy alcohol use over um, a month and it's pretty, it's pretty heavy alcohol use, you know, three to four drinks a day, pretty much every day at least um, to detect it. The, um, but it does have quite high um, specificity for the heavy alcohol use. So if you are, um, you get a positive result, it probably is because of quite heavy alcohol use and not because of, you know, some coexisting condition. Although a little caveat, there is some data about being affected by um, pregnancy and serious liver disease and potentially medications, but overall pretty, it's pretty good in terms of the specificity. Um, and there are quite a few different ways to test this in the laboratory, um, but there is, you know, there are sort of standards written out there of, you know, the, um, the, the Swedes for some reason are very big on alcohol biomarkers and, and they have this, the, you know, this um, document and people trying to decide what the standard way of testing it is and it's in this document. So if you were to try to use this, it would be good to know um, which method, like say you go to Quest and ask them to do it, make sure you know what method you're getting because um, it is, is imp it's important to know and some methods are a little bit better than others. Next. Okay, so ethylglucoronide, this is the marker that I mentioned that is in urine. It, um, it also gets deposited in hair and nails. Um, and um, we are uh, looking at trying to get that running um, in Monica Gandhi's lab. I saw Hideaki on the call, so go Hideaki to get this um, going. Um, it should be um, measuring heavy alcohol consumption over the prior one to three months. Um, it is 
there's less data on this biomarker compared to the biomarker I'm going to talk about. I think um, hair has some interesting issues. It's, it's nice that in one way it's non-invasive um, for collecting, in other ways maybe it is invasive if people are you know superstitious and worried about what people are actually using their hair for, or if they have expensive hairdos um, or or don't have hair. There there are issues there, but um, it's it's kind of a I would say this is a marker that people are thinking about um, using, and that there's you know we could talk about pros and cons of this one. I ha I have not um, used it yet. We're collecting data to use it um, in in a current study. Um, the other one that I have also not personally used, um, and there's even less literature um, on, is ETG in fingernails. It does deposit in fingernails, and that does um, reflect heavy alcohol consumption over even a longer window, which you know may be important for a study where you can't see people very often. I do also feel, though, that the longer the window, like the thing is depositing in your body, is probably going to have a little bit more um, variability person to person variability based on, you know, maybe your diet, your exercise, your other, the other things that you're ingesting. So I, I think that that's probably why these, these aren't as popular as, you know, the, the next marker I'm going to talk about PEF, which is a little shorter term. Okay. Oops, sorry, I missed one. Fatty acid, fatty acid ethyl esters. I also have not used this one. Um, I was about to use it in one of my first studies in hair and they said, no, actually ETG is better. So I didn't use it. The benefit just to know if you're doing maternal child health, it can be used to test meconium. So some um, studies have used this test to look um, in meconium to uh, assess alcohol exposure during pregnancy. Okay, okay. now my favorite biomarker, phosphatidylethanol or PEF. Next. Okay, so here's the, the PEF molecule. It's, an, it's a phospholipid that's found on the, on the membranes of red blood cells. It's formed only in the presence of alcohol, so theoretically 100% specific for detecting alcohol use. Um, it's, there are 48 homologs. It's based on this um, chain um, that's that gets attached, the pattern of the chain that gets attached to it. But there's one homolog that most labs test for and um, is known as 16-0-18-1, and that has to do with the designations on, on these chains that you see in the zigzaggy lines on the molecule. Um, but there are other varieties and people are looking at them and they, they may indicate different patterns of alcohol use a little bit. But overall, when people talk about PEF, they're really talking about this homolog. So it's measured in whole blood or dry blood spots and it uses um, liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry. So that's um, fairly sophisticated um, equipment. Monica's lab um, the, um, and Hideaki are also looking at trying to do this in their lab and there are other academic labs um, working on doing this testing. Next. Um, PET's half-life is a little shorter than CDT. It's four to eight days. So it can be detected for about two to three weeks after stopping heavy alcohol consumption. But it also has been shown to spike a little bit when, you know, if you're not drinking, then you drink um, a couple of drinks, it'll spike and it'll come back down. Um, and it has good sensitivity and specificity to detect any alcohol use or hazardous and heavy alcohol use, depending on where you set the cutoff. So it's a quantitative marker. If you set a really low cutoff, that would be like um, you say, if, oh, if, if, if it's detectable, then we're probably detecting any alcohol use. If you set a higher marker, a higher cutoff, that is a, a better cutoff for detecting hazardous alcohol use. And we did a, I, um, a meta-analysis, Pam's here on the call, she ground through all the data, where we had 21 studies and um, combined them to see what the sensitivity was uh, for PEF detecting um, self-reported hazardous alcohol use, and we found 82% sensitivity across 21 studies. Next, okay. So here's just a little bit more. So PEF has been studied, I said, uh, um, in experimental settings where they, they administer alcohol to people in a laboratory setting so they can really see what happens. So here's an example of one of those studies where they had seven people, they asked them to abstain for the prior week, and then they were given about four to five drinks a day um, per day for five, for five days. And then they were told not to drink. Um, I think they were observed, I'm not sure. And blood was drawn at all these um, time points. So what you can see from this graph is um, six of the people had zero PEF levels at the start. This one person had over 100. They probably um, didn't abstain that week before that they were supposed to, or they had been drinking really, really heavily in PEF hadn't left their system. You see that you see the PEF goes up 
stop with alcohol use. And then you see where the red line was when they needed to stop. They stopped drinking and the PEF comes down. Um, and it literally varies how quickly it came down per person. Some of it's based on how high it went up. You know, the higher the higher you go up, the slower it takes to go down. And that's, you know, probably inter individual variability. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so, so it come, it does, I mean, it, it is actually coming down at a fairly constant rate, but it does depend on how high it went up and how high it went up isn't really based, uh, since they were all drinking the same amount um, approximately, it's is more based on inter individual variability that some people they drink and their PET level goes to, you know, 50 other people here that it went up to, you know, over 200, although PEP actually can go really high, it can go into the thousands if you're, if you're really um, drinking heavily. Okay, next. Um, so how do we use PEF? Um, one way we use PEF um, that sort of helps make sense sort of epidemiologically when we're trying to do simple analyses is to categorize it. Um, and it works pretty well. There are, are suggestions of categories in the literature. Um, the Europeans have put out suggestions. Um, it's not necessarily data based from at least from their publication. Uh, they've done, they do, the Europeans, they do it a lot clinically. And I think that they're, they're maybe basing it on their clinical um, observations, but they suggest a cutoff of less than 35 nanograms per ml to be sort of their lower bounds for um, no, no use or, or very light use. And then above 210 for the excessive alcohol use. Um, and I generally agree with that. Although I think, you know, sometimes in our HIV field, we're, we're not looking for no or moderate use, but we are looking at a little bit lower level. We're not looking at the excessive use. Excessive use is like at least five or six drinks a day, almost every day. But there are people who are drinking too much that are causing them harm um, in terms of the whole HIV cascade that I was talking about that we call hazardous or, or unhealthy drinking at the two or three drinks a day. And that's actually where the cutoffs are a little bit more fluid. I have used, based on the literature, a 50 nanogram per ml cutoff, but I've seen sort of the range. I think the range from 35 to 80 is quite reasonable as, as if you wanted to use have a cutoff. Okay, next. You could also consider PEF as a continuous measure because the more um, of this metabolite in your body is reflective of how much, how much you have been drinking. Um, in the literature, PEF has been fairly well correlated with the total number of drinks over the prior two to four weeks. Um, with spearmint correlations from about 0.5 to 0.8. There are exceptions, there are, um, but I think those exceptions may have to do with the fact that um, self-report was bad, not that PETH was bad, but um, <laughs> we could debate that. Um, but there is, of course, as I mentioned, a lot of interperson variability, especially at the higher levels of PETH. So this picture is a study of 92 uh, people. I think they were in um, some kind of alcohol treatment program, but this is when they were entering the treatment program. And you can see that you know, there's a, a pretty good correlation, but there's tons of scatter. Um, so PETH as a continuous measure has to be treated carefully. Um, this this particular, they used um, micromoles per liter, um, which is a diff, it's, it's basically the numbers I was talking about um, divided by 703. Um, so you can see, so so the, it's the big numbers that, um, that, get, that get quite, you know, the variability seems to increase with the level of PETH. Okay, next. Um, before I get into sort of practicalities, there are sort of other questions about these markers, how they work. So just getting PET tests. Um, so I said it's in whole blood. So you can use whole blood, just take a tube of blood, but it needs to actually go into um, deep, deep um, freezer storage quickly because uh, PET can form in whole blood in whole blood. If you actually make a dried blood spot, either from the whole blood or just by doing a finger prick, the ethanol evaporates and the PEF isn't fault isn't um, formed, so th so that's fine. So whole blood is 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 a little trickier, uh, but maybe for your research purposes, if you're already drawing whole blood, you may want to do that. What I've actually done is I've had studies where we're doing like viral load, HIV viral load, other things. We do the blood draw and then we pipette it out onto a um, a Wattman 903 protein saver DBS card, um, and that works quite well. Um, but there's also thoughts about um, if you're in a situation where you're not doing a venous blood draw, you can definitely do it from a finger prick. It needs good collection technique. It needs consistent volume. And I'm excited to hear about self-collecting DBS because I think that's um, an important area. Um, so, and then I would say one commercial lab in the US um, does the testing It's called US Drug Testing Laboratories, but there are other academic laboratories that are gearing up that do do it and are gearing up to do it. So there may be 
um, more choices um, soon. I see Amy was asking question. Okay, given interpersonal variability. So that, um, so the, Amy asked, what variables do you typically collect in PEF analysis given interpersonal variability? So what we know so far is um, from work from Jan and from our um, meta-analysis, uh, body mass index actually affects PEF levels. It's, I mean, it's because it affects alcohol metabolism, like a bigger person can drink more and won't get as drunk as a smaller person. So, so the body mass index is definitely a variable. People with, body, with higher body mass index and the same alcohol consumption will have a lower, may have a lower PEF level. We found, we found that in our meta-analysis. We also found anemia is an issue because PEF is on the red blood cells. And so if you don't have as many red blood cells, you're not going to have as much PEF. Um, we, we found a suggestion of HIV, and I think the issue of HIV metabolism um, is an unknown one. That how, how do people with HIV metabolize their alcohol differently than people without HIV? Or people with HIV with, you know, suppressed virus, they sh should, it should be the same, but there, there are some hints that there may be something else going on. There may be other variables as well in there, um, but those are the ones that we have found so far. Um, so we we are trying to collect we do we do collect bmi when we can we're collecting hemoglobin for anemia um and of course hiv status and art status okay um my PEF hot tip is if you're interested in running path you're starting a study you don't have the money get the dbs because you can't go back you can't go back into storage serum it cannot be tested from serum or plasma it has to be whole blood or dbs so if if um, you're thinking about it um, see if you can get the DBS. Okay. Limitations. Um, this is kind of what I was just talking about. Um, it's um, dependent on how much ethanol is in the blood, which is dependent on how, how you metabolize your alcohol. And that is actually something that's going to be true of all alcohol um, direct biomarkers. Um, and I mentioned anemia body mass index. Oh, and we found liver fibrosis as well um, may affect May affect your PEF level somewhat. I think what I would point out is if you're talking, you know, you're looking at if you're looking at someone changing their alcohol use and their BMI stays the same, it doesn't really matter that much. Although, you know, I think we it needs to it could be explored some more. But so the the within person change is probably it's probably valid, but still it's it's good to you know have those measures if you can. So this um, I'm not going to go through it, but it's basically I think a summary of everything I just said. I can make this slide available if people want to just sort of have a quick handy sheet of looking at these markers. Um, okay, and then I said long term markers. I realize they don't really have long term markers except for um, the epigenetics. Um, people are looking at methylation patterns and they seem to be indicative of long term alcohol use, long term alcohol use. I do not know what purpose that might serve. I would hope that at least for lifetime alcohol use self-report is okay. Um, but it's it's there. I mean, maybe it, it may serve some um, function in the future. There were a couple of other little things that I saw back a few years ago in the literature and I never seen come to fruition. Um, one thing I have seen come to fruition is automated DBS processing um, that we're also um, that Hideaki is also working on in the in the hair laboratory of, of getting the um, just taking a little bit of the manualization out of out of processing the DBS um, so that that could lower costs a bit. The other thing is that see this this little blue thing that looks whatever <laughs> um, it's it's a device to actually collect PEF in breath, which I thought would is interesting if you want to get away from you know having to do blood draws. Again, I had not seen it go anywhere, but you know, keep an eye out. Maybe, maybe it may happen. It was also a European company that was working on that. And then I had seen also ETG in, um, I guess, must be excreted in sweat. So there was a skin patch that was collecting sweat. And I think that's actually a really interesting, um, you know, really low, low invasiveness um, measure that you know I would love to see move forward. I have not seen it move forward. Okay, let me see if I can. Okay, I'll do the advantages and disadvantages and then I'll stop Edwin and then we can have the break. Okay, so I probably hit on most of these things, but advantages that I see are they're objective, you have lower bias. Um, what's nice is that if you're doing a biological study, um, they probably, because they're related to how your alcohol is metabolized, it's probably related to physical harm as well. Um, they can be quite specific. Um, 
They can actually provide incentive for better self-report um, when you people know that you're collecting a biomarker, which you're gonna, you know, tell them your, what you're doing. They may um, have better self-report. I love the fact that they can be um, comparable across studies because NIH is paying for 100 here, 100 there. Let's. Um, I actually have a, a, a grant that's hopefully going to run where we're actually going to put these data together and be able to see what happens across studies. And they can have a decent um, look back period. Okay. Disadvantages, um, they're not point of care except for the, the transdermal alcohol, the breath alcohol and ETG. They all involve, involve some sort of specimen collection. So there's different levels of inv invasiveness. Um, there's the sensitivity issue and the dependence on the rate of alcohol metabolism, which is, you know, like I said, good or bad. And so far, um, other than the sort of repeat measures, um, they do not detect um, patterns um, of drinking. They're especially like PEF really does mostly seem to be a cumulative level of alcohol use. And of course, there's cost issues. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, we've got a question um, from Amanda Miller. Uh, how might the decreased sensitivity among persons with high BMI impact sensitivity of PETH in pregnant persons? <laughs> so we've got two things going on, increased BMI and pregnancy. Yes. What happens when you're pregnant, you make more blood. Is that right? What, <laughs> um, what happens in your, in your, um, I mean, the, B, the BMI is about the alcohol metabolism. It's not about like having, you know, more weight for being pregnant. So, but there, there could be, there could be stuff going on. There is, um, it's at the University of Arizona. Um, is it the University of Arizona? I think, um, or New Mexico, University of New Mexico, there's a researcher who's been looking at uh, PET in pregnant women. So I think I will, um, punch that to her. I, I don't know exactly. We haven't had pregnant women in our studies. There's also a study coming out with um, uh, American Indian populations, women who are pregnant using PETH with uh, Marty Jabers. His group is, is working on it with, um, with Mike O'Donnell. So that should be coming out relatively soon too. But that's a great team to, to, to target or to, to reach out to if you have questions on that. I don't know the, the specifics off the top of my head. Um, but they would definitely have some insight on it. Well, uh, well, thank you, Judy. A round of applause for Judy for the whirlwind tour of, of existing and potential future alcohol biomarkers. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now because Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So please stand up, um, hug your, your pets and loved ones or yourself, and we'll return um, in, in nine minutes at the noon hour and we'll get into our alcohol biomarker use cases, the nitty gritty and the real world field experience. Thanks everyone. Moving into the, the, the second um, part of our, our workshop where we really wanted to focus on real world cases, these, these use cases um, in, in, the, in the field. What's it like to actually use these? What are the, the challenges and advantages to using particular cutoffs um, and, and just the on the ground uh, real world knowledge that comes from actually doing, doing this as part, part of research. Um, and so we're going to, um, Judy's going to, uh, our resident expert in pets is going to lead us through some of hers. And then we're going to um, talk with uh, Julianne Jett and, and Yan Wang uh, uh, about some of the, the, uh, the newer biomarkers in use. So Judy. Thanks. So um, yeah, I was going to show you some of the sort of highlights of my PETH in action and my, my I think it's all PETH, my PETH journey. Um, although this isn't just PETH, so this slide was early on. Again, I was embedding um, collecting alcohol biomarkers into my mentor's um, study and he was actually, had, there were study visits going on and we, I got um, pilot funding to do this smaller study. And so we had, but we had to ask for consent for people to um, engage in the study. And we were going to collect all these different, I think we were collecting hair, blood, and urine for biomarkers. And what we, what we found was that um, the, the green line is how many people said, you know, in the parent study, how many people said they were actually um, engaging in current alcohol use prior um, in, in the parent study. And then when, after we consented them and enrolled them in our study, which was only sometimes the same day or within a, a month or two, um, the number basically doubled in self-report. So I felt like, you know, one of the um, uses of 
of alcohol biomarkers may be as a bogus pipeline. And, and so that actually does highlight the fact that um, perhaps you don't have to use the most expensive <laughs> biomarker if, you're go if you think that, okay, maybe it'll just help me improve my self-report. Well, next. Another study, this was basically based on, you know, the prior, these pilot studies, the R21, where I said, okay, PEF actually works in this population. Then I uh, got my first R1 that was looking at what was happening in alcohol use um, in people entering HIV care, because we had some data that looked like suddenly people were in HIV care and their alcohol use just completely was dropping. And we were like, wow, that's really amazing. But we weren't sure whether we could believe it. So we did the uh, study where we had quarterly visits where we measured alcohol use by self-report and by biomarkers. And actually the, the, um, the graph on the right is what we got by self-report using the audit C and a pretty low proportion were reporting unhealthy alcohol use by audit C and it was going down um, over time in, 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 within participants. Um, but when we actually looked at PEF and we combined, we had a combined score of PEF being above a threshold and or audit C being above a threshold because sometimes audit C is positive and PEF isn't based on the sensitivity of PEF. So we had this combined score. Then we found much higher levels of, levels of alcohol use and for the red line, the people on ART were actually, their alcohol use was actually increasing over time. So it represented A, that we weren't, the self-report wasn't helping us much and B, there is an urgency to um, start thinking about interventions to help people reduce the alcohol use in this setting. Okay, next. Um, this is, I just wanted to kind of give you an array of ways we've been using the biomarkers. This is actually ETG. Um, and this is a study that I'm conducting co-leading with um, Gabe Shammy at UCSF where we're looking at, we're use, actually using the biomarkers themselves as part of an intervention. So the ETG urine test can be used to say, oh, you're ETG um, negative. Um, it's sort of, it's a la contingency management. It's not exactly because it's very infrequent, but we're giving people financial rewards for having a negative ETG test. And, or we're also looking at um, a similar test for isoniazid, which is a drug that they're supposed to be taking to prevent tuberculosis. So we have a study where we're using these dipsticks um, and test um, to motivate incentives, um, whether or not someone gets an incentive for reducing their alcohol use. The long-term outcome will actually be PEF as um, for the alcohol use, and we have other measures for the adherence for the INH, but in terms of it, it's, it's part of the intervention is using these biomarkers. So that's another example of use. Next. Um, and I think this is my last example. We did a, an, a, an RCT of um, behavioral interventions to help people reduce their alcohol use, counseling-based interventions. And we have the cell phone because we um, sort of leveraged the cell phone use to have um, long, longer term booster sessions, um, et cetera. But the study outcome there was, um, was we're looking at number of drinking days and PEF levels. And so um, we had some interesting results there. Next slide. We we just unblinded recently. We haven't published this yet. So hot off the press. When we look at is a three arm study. The control arm is the green and the um, blue and red dots are the two um, fairly similar but little different flavors of the intervention arm. By self report, the alcohol use goes down fairly dramatically in the first three months and stays down and is lower for the intervention arms um, compared to the control arm. However. <laughs> Unfortunately, the phosphatidyl ethanol level starts high in all the arms and pretty much stays high in the study. So this is my, um, you know, certainly this is in Uganda where um, self-report is, you know, has, there's a lot of things going on with self-report, but we got, you know, very different results. And so I would, um, I would not, I would discourage anyone from just doing slide A, just doing self-report. I think you need to have some corroboration of what is going on. And this is using PEF as a continuous measure, so it's not it's not influenced by cutoff or anything. So you, you're actually that is lying. using PEF. We you know that was sort of what we did. We set out as the primary outcome. We sliced and diced it many ways, and it's still um, is there's not much change going on in the PEF while there is you know a lot more in the self report. And we did the social desirability scale, and as you go through a trial, the social de desirability um, does tend to increase. So people are are being potentially being influenced by being in a trial. Okay. Great. I think that's it. Uh, let me see. And... Oh, sorry. So I wanted to make a plug because I've been doing this work for a long time and um, we have a lot of data. I collaborate. I have a, 
a nice collaboration with Boston University um, and with collaborators in Russia, hopefully still, and Uganda, um, where we've been doing studies since around 2011. We have a whole um, biospecimen and data repository, and there's lots of um, interesting data questions that can be answered with those data. So I encourage if people want to um, get involved with the data or even getting involved with the consortium, we have talks and lots of things going on. Um, you could go to this website or I could put you in contact. Um, in addition, I mentioned this um, meta-analysis, individual participant data meta-analysis, where we get, gather data from 21 studies. Um, we had got, you know, did a lot of work putting together 6,000 observations. And um, so there's other questions that can be asked of those data. So, um, you know, if anyone, you know, wants some juicy um, data, I have, uh, you know, a lot of data and quite a few ideas of things that we could be could and should be looking at with those data. Um, and then Tor, had, I just want to thank, just back, I think there's so many people who contributed to this work um, at UCSF beyond NIH. And I also want to, I don't know those of you who um, knew Rich Sates, an incredible guy, really strong quantitative um, scientist who said, follow the evidence. And, um, you know, it's a, uh, this, this, I think about him while I presented this work because I talked to him about this work while I was going through it a lot. Great. Thanks.